Yeah, so the, the talk today, it's the areas that I've studied uh, in my PhD program. So uh, there are two areas, genetics and genomics. And the one that I'm going to focus on first, genetics, is a little more, is a little easier to understand. It'll take about half the time. I don't know if we'll get to the second part, but genomics, I think, is very interesting and has a lot more applications for machine learning. So if we can get there, then we'll have that conversation as well. Um, and yeah, I want people to just kind of chime in as they're as they have questions and keep it as a conversation more than me uh, dictating stuff to you guys. Um, just a little bit about me first. So I did my bachelor's in computer science at Indiana University many, many, many years ago now. Uh, I did a master's here at San Diego State in the computational science program. And I studied neuroimaging and autism there. And then after that, oops, ah. After that, uh, I did my PhD at UCSD and it's technically in the area of computational neuroepigenomics, which um, maybe you'll get a little better understanding of what that is uh, through, the course of, through the course of this talk. Um, so, so yeah, it's kind of the backwards of what Vibu and Ryan have done, whereas my training, I have three CS degrees. They're all different CSs, but they're all three CS degrees. And so I really focus on sort of the computational things in my studies, and then I've kind of shifted toward the business side of things and in the other side of my life. So I um, started an escape room when I was in grad school, um, started an axe throwing business. So none of these have anything to do with my, <laughs> my actual training. Um, but let's see, now I'm actually the chief data, data science officer at uh, a company called Wellbe. And so it's a telehealth startup. And so we'll see kind of where that goes. Uh, the idea is uh, basically monitoring people's diabetes and giving them sort of customized treatment plans to help uh, improve outcomes. So, so, all right. So, just to give you a sense of what I'm trying to communicate here, I want to familiar, familiarize you guys with uh, the biology of genetics and genomics, um, how we measure them. So, the, the the experiments for actually measuring them is just as interesting as the analysis in my part, um, and then also the analyses. Um, understanding your 23andMe better. So, maybe I'm the only one that has it, but if you decide to get it. <laughs> Or if you're looking at a friend's, then maybe you can kind of see what's going on in there and how they, how they got uh, the information that they got. Um, and then also, there's just a ton of publicly available data in these areas. And you may find that some project that you're working on, uh, having some genomics data or genetics data might be interesting and kind of help inform that, right? So for example, in a health project that I'm working on, being able to understand the genetics and how people are genetically predisposed to diabetes versus uh, behavioral changes is something that's really helpful. Um, so starting with the genetic side of things, um, it's sort of formally defined as the study of heredity and the variation of inherited characteristics. So um, I think the way that I think about it is how is variation in DNA associated with variation in traits? So whether you have autism or not, whether you have schizophrenia, how tall you are, whether you think cilantro tastes like soap, those kind of things. Oops. Okay, uh, and so why, does, why is genetics of interest? Why does it matter? Um, first off, it's helpful in understanding the role of genetics versus environment in a given trait. So for example, if we found out that autism is basically 100% hereditary and there's no environmental factor, then doing behavioral interventions is probably not gonna be where we spend a lot of our effort. However, if we find out it's the other way, then behavioral interventions are probably gonna be very helpful in those kind of diseases. Um, diagnosis of diseases, so a lot of times symptoms across diseases exhibit similar phenotypes, so they kind of present themselves the same way, but they have different mutations that underlie them and may need to be treated differently. And so that's a helpful place where genetics can help. Um, Computing risk scores for diseases like autism and schizophrenia. So a, in these cases, autism, for example, schizophrenia as well, doesn't present symptoms until autism, it's usually like two, two years on, and schizophrenia, it's actually in your teens, late teens. And so computing a risk score based on someone's genetics might help you know whether you need to kind of uh, prophylactically help these people and give them treatment that might prevent severe cases of, uh, of schizophrenia and autism. And then also personalized medicine. So because there is likely uh, a genetic component in how drugs work on different diseases, we can understand that and say if someone has this genotype, we can 
um, treat them with this drug or give them a different dosage or whatever. So those kind of things. And so going back to high school, well, at least it's high school for me because I didn't take any biology in college. Um, so with Gregor Mendel, so this is the pea plants that everyone probably remembers. Um, and so the general thinking of traits back during that time was that if you, if you had a tall mother and a short father, um, then you would be in the middle. Like everybody's sort of going toward the mean in a sense. And so Gregor Mendel had been working with pea plants and noticed that this wasn't actually the behavior that he saw. Um, for example, in some of these cases here with seed shape, he either saw round seeds or he saw wrinkled seeds. He didn't see ones that were kind of in the middle. With seed color, he didn't see some that were kind of a mix of yellow and green. He saw yellow or green. And so this presented itself as more of a, a binary sort of characteristic instead of a graded characteristic. And so um, doing a bunch of experiments and looking at um, kind of the heritability of these different traits, um, he proposed his theory of inheritance, which said um, there's this idea of dominance and recessiveness. So a one version of a trait would be dominant over the other. And so in order to show the recessive version, you have to have two copies of that. Um, each person has two copies of a trait, which wasn't obvious at the, at the point in time. Um, and then traits are passed on randomly to offspring. So based on this randomness, you would expect certain proportions of these traits to show up in the population. So if a trait is recessive, excuse me, if a trait is recessive, you would expect it to show up 25% of the time. Um, and these, let's see if I can move this. Okay. And these Punnett, oh shoot, maybe this. Okay, so these Punnett squares, I'm not gonna review these and stuff, but it's just basically a nice little diagram for kind of showing how these things, uh, how the population ends up. Um, so, but there's still kind of something that didn't make sense with this um, because he was, he was looking at phenotypes like uh, seed characteristics that seem to have this binary state. They were either um, round or they were wrinkled, smooth or wrinkled. Um, and other ones, but there were still other attributes like height, which if you just look at the human population, right, there's a, there's a range, it's a quantitative phenotype. So it's not just somebody's tall or they're short. And so um, there were basically a, a debate in the beginning of the 1900s where there was a group of the Mendelians who believed in what Mendel said about this dominance and recessiveness, but they couldn't, uh, couldn't explain phenotypes like height and then there was the other group uh, who was led by Carl Pearson. They were called the biometricians. I'm not sure 100% what that means. Um, but they were, arguing, they were arguing against Mendel saying this whole thing of dominance and recessive doesn't make sense because look at height. You have a graded gradation of heights. And I put these names in here. So Carl Pearson is the guy who uh, the Pearson correlation is named after because he invented it. Galton here, he's also one of the founders. He invented regression. And so it's interesting to see that a lot of the statistics emerged um, in an effort to understand these genetic association analyses back in the 1900s, late 1800s. And so this is kind of colloquially known as the P versus height debate. Um, and so Fisher, who you might also recognize as having a statistics test named after him, basically came up with a solution that brought the field together which is that if you have a bunch of these sites that have this dominant recessive trait, then if you combine them together, then you can explain things like height, which are graded. Um, and so the conclusion from that is that a bunch of genes control height and potentially other phenotypes that, um, that, that show these graded things. So schizophrenia and autism, for example, you have differences in the severity of them. And so you would expect a similar sort of structure underneath them which makes it challenging. It's not just so simple as like one gene, you know, this person has this one mutation, this gene is responsible for it, and we can kind of figure out schizophrenia that way. It's, it's much more complicated, as I'll show. Okay. And so just to kind of tie together, we're talking about DNA, but I want to just sort of mention how this gets translated into, uh, into actual um, proteins, which are the things that do stuff. In the body. Um, so the human body consists of 37 trillion cells, which alone is kind of miraculous. Um, and each cell contains a copy of the copy of the hereditary information, which is DNA. Um, this is something that 
was kind of gradually discovered over time, but the significance became clear in the 40s and the 50s. And so uh, finally, Mendel had his theory as to what inheritance was, but now we've discovered a mechanism for how that's actually transmitted. We have DNA. Um, and so DNA has these four different bases, A, C's, G's, and T's, and they basically encode for all the genes in your body. Um, one important characteristic of it, which we'll come back in a second, is this uh, tendency to bind to its complementary strand. So A's like to bond to T's and G's like to bond to C's and vice versa. So it, it has a strong, it, it's more stable and it has a strong tendency to bind to itself in that, that format. Another key point, which is consistent with what Mendel was saying about having the two copies of the alleles, is that we do have two chromosomes. Uh, well, we have two copies of each chromosome. So uh, for example, chromosome one, you can see uh, the two copies here. Can you guys see my mouse cursor? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Okay, cool. Yeah, so you got two copies here. And so you have two copies of every chromosome. And that's where that, um, you know, if you have a, a dominant copy of a gene and a recessive copy of a gene, that's one is stored on each of those chromosomes, um, also known as alleles. And uh, just one random little nugget, the chromosomes are numbered based on their size. So chromosome one, it's not that it comes first in any sense, it's just the biggest chromosome. And then chromosome 22 is the smallest. And those, um, those geometric shapes, they're exactly identical. So it's not like one copy is a little bit different in three dimensions than the other. In three-dimensional space, so that's where we get into genomics. Um, they, you know, kind of the geneticists don't really think about what's the structure of DNA. They just sort of look at it as a sequence of nucleotides that have informational content for making genes. The genomicists, which is what I did my research in mostly, actually look at it as a very interactive molecule, and that's how, by manipulating its structure, is how you turn genes on and off. And so, yeah, it's very likely that there's differences. I was just looking at like number nine. It, it looked, it, I've, I've seen a lot of uh, pictures where it looks like a K. Yeah. And, and so is that is that is that real? Like the copy is differently shaped than than the, the original. Um, I mean, this here is kind of a a very condensed, zoomed out version. There are going to be a lot of nuances when you zoom into it, and so they'll be differently shaped. They. Okay, got it. Yeah, that's all I wanted. To yeah, okay. Sorry to distract. No, 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 no worries. That's, uh, keep the questions coming. So, um, so Chris, can you yeah. hear me? Yeah, Just, uh, every one of those two strands has its own full DNA with, a, with both sides of the helix. Is that correct? Yes, that's correct. So, okay. so, so, there, so there's a double helix on the left side and a double helix on the matching right side. Exactly, exactly. And then, so in all, you're going to have 22 times two, right? So you're going to have 44 of those plus um, two X's if you're female or an X and a Y if you're, if you're male. Um, and there's even actually some really interesting, uh, really interesting studies in there where they take mice and they move genes from the Y and X chromosome and cross them over and you can get all kinds of uh, gradients of, of sex in, uh, different, uh, in mice and stuff. It's actually really interesting to to understand the effects of how each gene plays a role in, in sexual development. So, um, so genotype, uh, just to clarify, this is the sequence of the uh, DNA that encodes a particular trait. So maybe you have two copies of A, maybe you have an A and a T at a particular position, maybe you have a C and G. So this is kind of the, the genetic code at that position for a given individual. And then the phenotype is the physical manifestation of that trait. So do you have brown hair? Uh, how tall are you? Uh, do you or do you not have autism? Or where on the spectrum do you fall, et cetera? Um, and so then, like I said, proteins are the, the workers. They are the molecules that actually do things in the body. And so DNA is stored in the nucleus and has the information for making them. But we have to get a copy of that information out um, to, to the uh, cytoplasm of the cell in order to make proteins. Um, and so that's this process where RNA comes in. And so basically, uh, you know, molecules go into a small section of DNA, they make a copy of it, and they take that copy and they ship it out to another part of the cell where the proteins are synthesized. Um, and so there's actually some really interesting theories where RNA 
uh, it's called RNA world, which is where the whole world basically consisted of RNA and that DNA evolved later as a stable way of storing information for RNA. So um, it's kind of interesting to think about those things. So yeah, but the point I'm trying to make here is just how DNA has its effect. So it's sort of like a recipe book that has the information to make things and the things that are ultimately made are proteins. Okay. And so now I want to go through what a, a genome, a genetic association analysis would look like. So the first, the, basically the three steps that you would do, you measure your phenotype of interest, and we're going to go through an example on schizophrenia. Um, then you measure the sequence of the A, C's, G's, and T's for a given set of individuals. And then you correlate the variance for each of those loci that you measured with the phenotype of, in, phenotype of interest and see uh, which ones are associated. Okay, and there are two kind of main classes of analyses, which this is common in many areas. The first one you can do is a very hypothesis driven. So for example, if you're in a lab, your lab studies one particular gene and you have very strong reason to believe that's associated with autism, you don't really care about looking at the whole genome, you're just gonna look at the variability in that gene and relate it with autism. The benefit of doing that is you have a lot of sort of scientific evidence that says this is probably involved in, in autism, so you have a stronger belief for that. Um, and the other benefit is that you don't have the multiple comparison problem that you have when you test the whole genome. The, um, so the other approach is the genome-wide association study, where let's say with schizophrenia, we don't know, you know, we don't have a hypothesis about which genes are involved. We just want to look at them all. And so you do a genome-wide association study, um, also known as GWAS. Um, and then the benefit of that is that you're going to detect basically uh, loci across the whole genome. The disadvantage is because you do so many statistical tests, you're gonna have to correct substantially for those. And so you have to have a lot of data to be able to significantly detect um, things with small effects. Okay, so going through the schizophrenia example, and just kind of following uh, through this uh, kind of landmark paper here, um, biological insights from 108 schizophrenia associated genetic loci. So the first step is uh, measure, our, measure our phenotypes. And there are some consortiums that basically collect data. A lot of them are based in Europe, but you know, someone gets diagnosed with schizophrenia, um, they, they do their genotyping and get their sequencing information and maybe some additional information about them that can then be used in these consortiums that the academics access to kind of look at these things. And so they're really, in a sense, large collaborations across many universities where each university is working with the doctors to collect schizophrenia uh, profiles and, and controls as well in order to generate the genotyping data and stuff necessary to do this. And so in this study, they had 30, almost 37,000 uh, schizophrenics and then um, 113,000 controls. And so once you, once you have your population, you need to get your genotyping information. And so we want to measure the sequence of A, C's, G's, and T's for a given set of individuals. And what's interesting about this is that, you know, because we're human, most of our DNA is very common. It's, it's the same across individuals. And so there was a large effort after the, uh, the genome project to identify the positions in the genome that differ among individuals. And so those are called SNPs, um, single nucleotide polymorphisms. So it's kind of a hard term to swallow, but if you just think of SNPs as a place in the genome where there's variation in humans, that's, it, that's the pretty straightforward definition. And so um, they've created a database of these SNPs and each of them has an ID number. Um, you can just, so the ID number is this RS6277. Um, organism is homo sapiens, so humans. Uh, this is where it's at, so it's on chromosome 11 at this position. The alleles, so this is the, the two copies that you have. What this is saying is that the reference genome has a G, and then there's also uh, been an A observed in some individuals. And then the other point of interest is just what is the frequency that A shows up? And it's about 40% of the time. These are just kind of different studies that have tried to estimate that. 
Uh, um, Chris, can I have, ask a question about this? Yeah. And you may have already covered it, but is, are you talking about sections that are between a start and a stop of, of an expression of a gene or anywhere, anywhere on the genetic sequence, there can be SNPs that are, exhibit this polymorphism? Yeah, yeah, it can be anywhere in the genome. And so they focused on identifying uh, pretty much anywhere because mm. and it, it's still becoming clearer, but it's not completely clear um, as to, you know, what the significance of these mutations, these SNPs in different regions of the genome mean. Mm -hmm. But clearly they exist. Um, if they're correlated with diseases, then they have some implication, right? They're doing something. And so can we figure it out? Um, it turns out that most of them aren't in protein, co uh, protein coding regions, so they don't actually code to make genes. So it's not the proteins that are getting screwed up, it's some sort of regulation of the proteins. So maybe a protein isn't being turned on or isn't being turned off, or it's expressed too much or not enough. Um, and so that'll, that'll become a little clearer. My understanding of how we're able to tell like when say chimpanzees and humans split or when like how related I am to you, for example, based on our genetic material is mm -hmm. that there are sections of our genome that do not get turned into, that are not part of the genes because they're outside of the start and stop, um, I don't know, markers. Mm -hmm. um, and therefore they don't get selected and therefore probability, probabilistically you and I, if we, diverged recently, we would have fewer changes in those areas of our genomes than say a chimpanzee and I, because we split um, in, a, in a much earlier time. But if these areas outside of the start and stop actually do get expressed and do have a factor in whether an individual gets selected or survives and so forth, mm -hmm. then that changes that conversation quite a bit, doesn't it? Yeah, so this, is the, this goes back to this idea of junk DNA. So I don't think scientists probably called it junk DNA. I think this was, you know, some, for lack of a better term, we don't know what it is. So we know now that about 2% of the genome codes for proteins. And so originally it was thought that these proteins were what were changing to, to be the difference between a chimpanzee and a human, right? They just have different proteins than we do or modifications. Um, in reality, it seems that the areas that tell us when to turn on a gene or protein, uh, when to turn it off, um, those things are the things that are actually changing. And so it's kind of like when you're building a house, um, you know, the outcome is, uh, how, to, how to get this analogy out? Um, you're using the same set of tools, but you're just introducing them at different times to get a different house, right? And so one case, you might start with concrete, another, you might start with digging a hole in the ground, like, it's, it's that kind of analogy where the tools are the same, the proteins are the same for the most part, but when they're introduced, turned on and off is what's different. Um, so that's one of the, so that was pretty uh, a, a novel. Dogma was definitely that it's the proteins that are changing, but it turns out that, you know, humans and chimps have mostly the same proteins. There are some modifications, but um, that it's mostly the expression levels of the proteins that have changed. Does that, that make sense? That makes sense. So, but my question was more like, uh, we've, we've, we've been making estimates of like when chimpanzees and humans diverged, right? Mm -hmm. And I thought, I could be wrong, you, you, you know more about this topic, but I thought that we were looking at areas that are not expressed uh, in phenotype and therefore cannot be selected by evolution. Um, if those areas turn out that they actually do get expressed in phenotype, in other words, they mm -hmm. do affect whether an individual gets selected by evolution or not, mm -hmm. then the conversation about, the conversation changes because, uh, you know, the estimate of when we diverge based on the probability now changes because it's not just probability anymore. Now we're saying there is selection in those areas of the, of the genome. Yeah, the, no, there's definitely selection in those areas of the genome. We know that now. That's mostly mm -hmm. what has been changing. Um, how it affects those estimates, I have no knowledge of that domain. Uh, there's, this is the thing with genomics is there's all these questions are such detailed, complicated things where you have to zoom into so many factors. So where you're dealing with ancestral DNA, mm -hmm. um, it's, it's a very challenging different problem. So I don't know exactly how they're 
how they're testing those things to get that estimate. But mm -hmm. um, if originally they were thinking that the mutation, the mutations outside of proteins didn't really matter, then yes, that would have a that would have changed. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, and and just a, one final note here on this slide. So the DB, oops. All these SNPs that I was talking about, there's a big database of them. All this stuff is publicly available. Um, there's a genome browser, so you can go look at any position in the genome, um, kind of see like, oh, what's the sequence here um, for humans and all kinds of other organisms. Um, and yeah, these SNPs were partly a result of these two projects called the HapMap and the Thousand Genome Project. And so these projects really focused on identifying different ethnic groups across the world to try to find um, things that, you know, partly to answer the story of how humans came out of Africa and sort of, you know, how we kind of migrated into different areas of the world and stuff to understand that, but then also um, to understand disease and stuff that may be affected in certain races differently than others as well. So, so these are projects that are all kind of completed now, um, but they were pretty cool, big projects back in the day. Um, hey, Chris. Yeah. Um, really, really basic question. Sure. Approximately how many nucleotides are in human DNA? Um, you know what, most, I couldn't, I honestly can't answer the question. Um, most of the SNP, the SNP assays that I'm going to talk about in a second um, measure around a million. It depends on what you're interested in doing, um, but I, I honestly don't know. It's more than a million, but it not, not much more. So I think, I think what I remember from 20, 30 years ago when I read a few books on this topic was like 4 billion, but I could be wrong. 4 billion. The genome is only 3 billion bases long. So, um, so yeah, I, I don't know what he's asking, right? Are, are you asking? No, you're talking many? about the variability. And so, no, 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 no. I was asking even much simpler. Just, yeah, how many bases total? Oh, how many? Oh, I heard variability. Okay, the SNPs. So, yeah, so then just to clarify a couple of things. So, yeah, 3 billion bases in the human genome. I think it's like 3.1 or 2, actually. Um, and then, yeah, the, so the SNPs are just the locations in the genome where there's actually variability. Um, between individuals. So just to clarify that one. So, um, all right. So yeah, so if we have this. And those SNPs here, can be more than just one single base pair, correct? Uh, yeah, it could be that there are three or four bases. Um, the example and that I gave, and it's, it's here, there's just been a G observed and an A observed in that position in humans, but it's possible that some could have three. I was wondering if there's a sequence of uh, base pairs that line up to create a single SNP. Is that is that not true? A sequence of base pairs. I, don't know. I guess SNPs are, are defined as a as a single uh, location for a single base. Am, am I understanding it, it, it correctly? That, it's by definition, yeah. There's okay, got it. I understand. totally understand the confusion because it took me weeks to get this when I started grad school. So yeah, it's a yeah. So just single bases that um, vary across individuals. And so most of the areas in between those are gonna be, uh, we're gonna have exactly the same DNA. So yeah, so the single part of the SNP is important. Um, okay, so just sort of following along with that SNP that we were talking about, how, how can we measure this um, if we wanna you know, get uh, people's DNA sequencing, well, not DNA sequencing, their genotype. We wanna know what version of the SNPs they have so we can correlate that with having schizophrenia or not. Um, okay, so with this SNP here, the most common uh, version has a G in this position. And so I've just looked up the rest of the sequence uh, around this position. And so this is gonna be consistent across all individuals. Um, about 60% of individuals will have a G that's here where it's red. And then the other 40% will have an A. But then, there, like I said, the rest of this sequence surrounding it is going to be the same. Um, okay, so the idea goes back to the complementarity of DNA. So if we wanted to detect whether someone had this sequence or if they had this sequence, what we could do is design, synthesize the complementary version of it and see if it binds to uh, the, the first complement or the second complement. And so... Yes. Yes. Uh, quick question. Sorry. Do that, th this little sequence that you're showing with that code for like one amino acid or something? Um, well, amino acids, there are three, uh, three nucleotides per 
amino acid is the- Oh, only three, okay. Yeah, yeah. So this is just like this is just a kind sequence of, of amino acids. And that, mm -hmm. and the change from a G to an A within that change, the amino acid, or could it still code for the same amino acid? Um, so that would be two questions, right? So the first question is, is it in a coding um, region? Uh, so it may be in a non-coding region, which is 98% uh, yeah. of DNA. Uh, okay, um, right. So then it may not matter in terms of that. It can affect other things. If it is in a coding region, then I would have to look at the, the mapping of nucleotides to, to, to amino acids, which are the uh -huh. components of proteins. Um, so, yeah. And this is why you don't see as many mutations in proteins is because they, they screw up things way more than the mutations outside of proteins. Yeah, that's what I was thinking. You change, if you change one of these bases and it changes what it's coding for, you could completely change a protein, right? And then exactly. it would be non-functional and yeah. Okay. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. Okay, yeah. thanks. Yeah, no problem. Um, all right. So yeah, so we got our two sequences here. Maybe you have two copies of this. Maybe you have two copies of this, or maybe you have one of each. Those are the possible outcomes uh, that we could have here. And so we designed these complementary probes. So as you can see, remember the T likes the A, G likes C, and so forth. And so because we want to detect a G here, um, we've put a C. And then in this case, it's basically going to be the same complement, except we have a T here because we're trying to detect an A. And so this is the base principle of how we can build a, an assay, an experiment, to, to measure which version a person has. So what we do is we take their DNA, we extract it, uh, we cut it up into small pieces, and we attach a little optic, um, optic probe on the end of it. So that way it lights up as green. And then we introduce it into an array that has a bunch of little, bunch of little uh, you know, beads on it, that's what they're called, um, beads, have these complementary probes attached to them. And so if, in this case, something binds to A and the complementary probe in A is this here, then we know that they must have had a G at that position. Um, and so this is how we basically design a whole bunch of complementary probes and put them on these arrays so that we can detect which, uh, which sequence that an individual has. And so they light up green or dark or green or some other color? Exactly, yeah. So it, there's a bunch of different ways of doing this. To keep it simple, let's just say bright green, if you have two copies, um, my, a, mild, a more moderate version of green if you have one copy, and it doesn't light up if you, have, uh, if you don't have any copies of it, right? And so each of these little, this is kind of an image of a microarray. Um, each of these little circles here corresponds to one of those wells. Um, and so it can get more complicated. You can introduce red and do a, a bunch of different things with it. But I think the, the basic idea is you, knowing what the SNPs are, you design these probes that are just complementary sequences of DNA. And then you introduce someone's DNA into it to see where it binds. And then based on this little, little optic piece that's attached, you can figure out what their genotype is from that. So I know that's a lot. Any questions? And then Chris, another basic question. So in your uh -huh. first step where you said you get the patient DNA, mm -hmm. actually you get the patient DNA and then you make lots of copies of it, right? So you um, the amount of yeah. volume? Yes, yes. That's the thing. I, actually, the next slide will address that one, one thing there. Yeah. Yeah, so typically you'll make a lot of copies of it. Because like, for example, with 23andMe, you just spit in a small tube. And so they don't have much, but they can use a technique um, to, to amplify that. So, um, so then just to finish this slide real quick, uh, I want to clarify, this is called genotyping, what we're doing here. So we're measuring the positions of variability across humans. And so I don't know if you have some weird things going on in between these areas. So these kind of, you know, an individual can have some random mutations that happens in them. What I only know is kind of, based on the majority of variation in the population, I know where you fall in that thing. So, so DNA sequencing, which is the second half, um, we can actually get your full sequence. Um, and so, uh, like I said, this usually measures around a million SNPs, not the whole genome. 
And one good thing about it, one of the reasons why 23andMe is able to make this work is that it's cheaper. It's a lot cheaper than DNA sequencing. Um, it's a, about on the array you use, um, $300 per person. Um, you're, you know, when you subscribe to me, you're largely subsidizing that. I assume because they do so many, um, so many experiments, they probably get a very discounted rate or maybe they do it in house. Um, so, you know, that fee that you pay at the beginning is largely paying to sequence your data, well, to genotype your data, and then they're turning around and selling it and doing stuff with it. So <laughs> it's an interesting business model. Um, and then going back to Ted's point with the, the copying, um, yeah, genotyping and DNA sequencing require a, a, a decent amount of DNA to actually work. And so um, this guy, Kerry Mullis, back in, 90, uh, well, back in the early 90s, late 80s, invented a technique called polymerase chain reaction, PCR. Um, and what it does is it just takes the amount of DNA and it makes a whole bunch of copies of it. And so it's actually been really critical in solving some cold cases. Um, I, love, I love to watch forensic trials and those kind of things. Uh, you know, there's been very small samples of DNA left behind that, you know, 1970 or 1960, when the murder happened, we couldn't test it, but they're able to use PCR to amplify that DNA and actually uh, do the genotyping or sequencing to, to figure out who it is. And then also this is really critical, this amplification step is really critical in ancestral DNA. So when they find bones um, and they, they just have a small amount of DA, DNA in it, right? If they find a Neanderthal or something, they don't have a lot of DNA left. So they have to use PCR to really amplify that to get a good signal. So DNA actually decays pretty, pretty quickly over, over time. It's, it's a stable molecule, relatively speaking, but over you know millions of years and stuff it's not not very good at keeping it together okay so at this point we've got our clinical groups we have the schizophrenics and non-schizophrenics the control we've measured their genotype so for let's say a million positions we know if they have an a a c a g or a t there and then the final thing is the math um, so correlate the variance for each loci in the genome with the phenotype of interest um, and it's a, it's a regression, logistic regression analysis is what they typically do. So um, let YI be the phenotype for the individual I. And so we'll use zero for the controls and one for the cases. Um, let XI be the genotype of an individual. And so the way they encode it here is um, they pick the most common allele typically. Um, and make it the, the reference one. And so say G is the most common version that is present in the population here. They'll give you a two if you have two copies of G. They give you a one if you have one copy of G and they give you a zero if you have no copies of it. And so what we're really looking at is an association with the, the number of copies of G that you have in this position. Um, this would be problematic if there was a third variant that was significant in the population. Um, but this is, the, this is the way they typically do it. And so just a logistic regression. You got your beta for your slope. Um, XI here, this is the number of copies of the, of the allele that you have. And these, these uh, variables over here are important. They're covariates that you can include in your model. So for example, if you're concerned that gender might have an effect or race or um, you know, some sort of experimental conditions, any kind of thing, you can include those in your model to account for them. So that way, if this test significant, it's significant sort of independent of the effects of these other variables, um, because there's going to be a lot of correlation with other factors. So, hey, and Chris? then, yep. Yeah, you're talking about the 0, 1, 2, G, 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 T, T, T. Those are the only possibilities, unless you're saying that you could also have an A. Correct, right. So, so if someone has an A at that position, um, then you would have to do a different test. Most cases, there's just two alleles, like two, two different nucleotides that show up at a different position. Um, so this is kind of the simple model. I don't remember, you can, I don't remember exactly how they deal with three. Um, I think you would just do two separate models basically um, for that. So, um, let me see here. And yeah, so you're going to get a p-value out from this logistic regression, which tells you whether this beta one here is significant. And then you need to correct for multiple comparisons. 
So there's been a lot of effort in the genomics field. Like I said, they're all mostly statisticians real, in reality. Um, that's mostly the kind of people that you find in the area. Um, to, so there's been a lot of effort to try to figure out what is the correct threshold to correct for because um, with Bonferroni correction, um, which is a type of multiple comparison correction, it assumes that there's no correlation, um, but the genome is actually highly correlated. So if um, Ken has a C at position 100, then I can usually tell you with high probability what he has at position 150. Um, so, this, so there's correlation in there. So you want to kind of take that into account. And I'm not, I don't know that stuff, nor am I going to attempt to explain it, but they've agreed upon basically 10 to the negative eight as the threshold that's appropriate for, for correction. Um, and so then you end up with a plot that looks like this. Um, so does anybody have any questions? This is kind of the results. Um, does anybody have any questions about what we did so far before I continue on? Okay. Just a, just a comment then, uh, if you go back one slide, uh, isn't mm -hmm. that all those correlations you mentioned uh, are, are in fact the covariates that you could put into the model? Uh, because you mentioned the covariates being the, just the demographic uh, kind of variables. I'm, I'm assuming that those covariates actually can be a lot more than that, like can be the correlations within the genome. Um, yeah, so you're going to run one of these logistic regressions for every position in the genome. Um, so that's okay. going to have, if you have a million SNPs that you measured, you're going to run a million of these logistic regressions. And so you're going to get a million p-values out. With regard to the covariates, um, yeah, this can be a variety of different things. It can be gender, race information. Um, if you're studying diseases that are highly comorbid, so um, an example of that is ADHD and autism. So if someone has autism, there's a very high probability that they have ADHD. Um, right. You want to include that to control, control for that. You want to say, I want to know what's happening in the pure autism cases. Mm -hmm. um, so you can basically anything that you fear is correlated with this that you don't want to be considered, you would include that information to try to cancel it out, basically, to regress it out. And why doesn't that also include all the other uh, uh, SNPs that you are considering? Why don't you do a single logistic regression against all your features? Right. So single. Uh, so so instead of having a single um, yeah. SNP, you'd have all the right. SNPs that you measured, that entire array, and you would do one logistic regression against your target variable. What would be? Uh, I honestly don't know the answer to that. Um, I mean, like I said, these, these guys are mostly statisticians. I'm sure they have a good reasoning for it. Why? <laughs> yeah. um, what would be the challenge? Like, I'm sure it would take a long time to train. But other than that, yeah. and, it would, and, and you have to decide on some regularization so, so that it focuses the, the model on the areas of the gene that matter. But um, Yeah, I'm sure there's a statistical argument, though. Like, if they're correlated, if two SNPs are correlated with each other, then how do you yeah. assign the significance that's um, right putting logistic, them in the same model, right logistic regression will have difficulty with collinearity between features yeah. linear right, but, but, but the standardized coefficients would take care of that within the single logistic regression model right so if you have multiple uh, of this kind of snips um, if I'm following what Hobson is saying, and in social science, it's, it's the same way. Like if you put a lot of independent variables into the logistic uh, regression model, your standardized coefficient will tell the, the non-overlap contributing factors uh, and effects for each of those um, independent variables. From what I remember, it it just sort of spreads out the, the effect onto all the covariates in proportion to how varied they are with the target variable. And so it, it gives you a, an accurate way of normalizing for all the other confounding variables. And you just go in and look at the largest ones to figure out what the largest Yeah, so, so the problem you would have, Chris is saying that there's, there's um, um, a lot of, of correlation between different parts of the genome. Uh -huh. so, so just simplistically, if you had 10 different things that all um, flipped from, from uh -huh. G to T together, uh -huh. 
okay? When you did the logistic regression with all of them, you'd, you'd get randomly, you know, one-tenth the signal for each of them. Exactly. So you'd, but, but, you, you would have, you would potentially not make your threshold for statistical significance because the effect was diminished. Yeah, the, the effect has no ten. effect on, on P. The P is right. um, determined uh, through, anyway, but, um, and because all the logistic regression cares about is it's a classification problem is the sum of all those together. And so they, they end up getting summed together and that's what creates that P value. But, um, but anyway, that's just the way I've always done it. So it's sort of the automatic way to normalize for everything without having to do a lot of statistics. But um, so I can't, I, I, I've never, I've never heard of doing it manually. Actually, actually, this, this kind of approach, uh, it, it's been done in the two ways that uh, either that the, the approach that Chris described or the, the approach that Hobson you described in my field. And that's actually a pretty interesting debate. Like what kind of, how many uh, variables you put into the model um, and then the interpretation of that. Oh, wow. But anyway, we can revisit that probably as a more kind of broader topic. Yeah, it'd be something to, good to look in when you're to discussing logistic regression and stuff sometimes to understand that. It's a, definitely something that I've always kind of wondered about. And I don't know the correct answer to. Any other, any other questions then? Okay, so then what we have here is what's called the Manhattan plot. I'm not sure if you can guess why it might be called a Manhattan Manhattan plot. Manhattan, then that means you're, you're having bad luck because you don't have anything that's significant. Um, so let's go through the plot. So on the y-axis, what we're plotting is the p-value for each of these um, statistical tests that we ran, but we're plotting the negative log p-value. Um, let me see. So basically, the higher up the point is, the more significant that that loci is. On the y-axis, on the x-axis, we're just plotting uh, the different uh, the different chromosomes basically, and it oscillates between uh, red and blue to to kind of make that distinction. So um, this red line here is the multiple comparison threshold, so it's ten to the negative eighth, roughly. And so everything that's above it, in theory, is a significant loci in the genome that is associated with schizophrenia. Um, and so the green indicates significant SNPs or ones highly correlated with them. And so as we're talking about the genome, neighboring positions in the genome are higher, highly correlated. And when I say neighboring, I don't mean necessarily like right next door, but you know, within 100, 1,000 base pairs, there's a strong correlation. Um, and so they, they've, colored, they've colored them in kind of these blocks um, where there's a lot of adjacent ones. And so they kind of lump it into 108 distinct loci is what they call it that they're finding a strong enrichment for these significant SNPs. And so uh, the implications here is that schizophrenia, you know, is not, there's not a couple genes that cause schizophrenia. There's at least 108 loci with the powered study that they have, which is, you know, not huge, um, that they've identified that are implicated in, in uh, schizophrenia. And so if you study schizophrenia, it's like, wow, that's really complicated. So. Um, we expected this with height. With schizophrenia, maybe it was a little bit of a surprise because um, there's a lot of uh, maybe sort of simplistic theories that uh, can't, would have a hard time kind of integrating all 108 of these different loci. Um, so do people have questions about the, the Manhattan plot, kind of what it looks like or what it means? Okay. Um, and so, yeah, just to kind of summarize from like what we've learned using GWAS from the last uh, you know, 20 years or so, um, very few diseases and phenotypes are Mendelian, um, these single gene diseases. So there are, there are some, but most of them are more complicated. And so examples of the, the Mendelian ones are like cystic fibrosis, sickle cell anemia, Huntington's disease, um, where we know, you know exactly what position in the genome causes it. And because we know it's just one position, it's very, you know, if you focus on that gene and what that gene does and what happens to that gene's function whenever the mutation occurs, um, 
it's, it's much easier to understand and develop a treatment for it. Um, those kind of diseases are also good diseases that maybe CRISPR, when it's safe to use in humans, can fix because it's just a single mutation that needs to be go in and repair. Something like schizophrenia, um, where there are just a whole bunch of loci, you can't even think about CRISPR going in and repairing uh, the, the, uh, that many loci. So, um, but yeah, most diseases and traits aren't these Mendelian diseases. They're associated with many loci, rather. And then each of those loci accounts for a small amount of the overall variance. And so when you, when you think about schizophrenia, it's not like, do I have one of these mutations? It's sort of how many of these mutations do I have? And it kind of adds up. And the more you have, the more likely you're going to have a severe case of schizophrenia. Um, so, so this comes, this seems to be the understanding of these, uh, these diseases now based on these GWAS studies. Um, most SNPs associated with schizophrenia and many other diseases do not code for proteins. They are non-coding. And so um, the significance of them is less clear at this point, but that's, in, you know, that's kind of the direction where things are going, is to try to understand what these non-coding regions are doing and how they're leading to schizophrenia. And so the, the most likely explanation for them is uh, regulation of gene expression. So how much a gene is expressed. If, uh, Maybe a gene isn't getting turned on in schizophrenia. Maybe it's being overly expressed or underly expressed. All right, and one important point too, the way this way GWAS is set up is it doesn't examine the interaction between genes, which in the field is called epistasis. Um, it would just be impossible to do that because there are so many potential genes. You know, if you're if you're analyzing a million SNPs, then you're going to have a million squared potential interactions if you just want to look at second order reactions. Uh, interactions, but it's very obvious that they're going to be interactions. So um, this is kind of a simplistic way in some respects of looking at it, but it's a, it's a good starting point. Okay. And then just kind of applications for machine learning in this area. So we do one of these GWAS studies. We have a list of genes, but what do they do? Um, one potential application is mining the academic literature to understand better gene functions. Um, there's not a great curated database, so to speak, of what genes do. The literature is very messy and distributed and very difficult to analyze. And so this is a potential area because this is really what the next, the next step is gonna be, right? Okay, well, these genes are doing something in schizophrenia, but what are they doing? And really trying to understand the function of these genes is gonna be a critical critical thing. They may not that may not be necessary to treat disease. You may be able to just target certain genes with medication that we already have, which I mean we're already treating treating diseases like schizophrenia and stuff. So um, another interesting one, and I know there's some stuff going on at UCSD on this, which is the polygenic risk score. So basically, um, you know, you have someone genotype and you want to predict the probability that they will have schizophrenia. Autism is a, I don't know much about schizophrenia because I've studied mostly autism, but autism is an interesting one because there's a lot of evidence that very early intervention with these kids can really kind of send them on a different, better trajectory. Um, and so having a, you can see that being very valuable to a parent, especially um, there's a high probability if there's someone schizophrenic in the family already, or not schizophrenic, sorry, um, autistic, that someone else is going to have it, and so to know if your child is is at uh, at risk for that, and to have some sort of score for that will be really helpful. And I think it'll. I don't know how much it's actually used in the industry right now, but there's a lot of effort to get these risk scores. And then the personalized medicine thing as well. So, Take someone's G, I should give them a half a dose of the medication, whereas people that have this variation here, um, they should get two pills, or maybe they should be treated with a different medication. So all of these are kind of efforts of aggregating information across these different loci into some sort of medical outcome or, or scientific uh, research area. So do people have questions about that? All right.
And then I just want to mention this just because it seems kind of like an, an obvious thing to mention, um, heritability. So uh, it is important to know if a, if a disease is heritable or not, because if a disease is highly heritable, like I said earlier, then maybe there's nothing that intervention can do. And then it's, uh, if it's not highly heritable, then there's a lot of things that we can do about it. And so the typical way that they analyze these are using twin studies. And so what you do is you compare um, monozygotic twins. So the idea is that monozygotic twins, they have the same genome and they grow up in the same, uh, the same environment, right? They're the same age, they're progressing through, through, through life together in many respects, whereas the dizygotic twins have that same environment, they're born at the same time, they progress through life together, but they have different genomes. And so to see what the difference is in these disorders or different phenotypes in general, this is a lot of how they determine how heritable um, a, a, different, a different trait is. And so there's some uh, nice little graph here of some of the recent calculations. So something like eye color, um, it's based on their calculations, pretty much 100% heritable. Uh, the larger green bars indicate more heritable. Uh, so eye color, blood group, very heritable, whereas things like obesity and violent behavior, those are considered uh, very lowly heritable, relatively speaking. Or gene so, sequencing, uh, this is the only way we could come up with uh, estimates of genotype and phenotype. Because if we had to look at twins, twins were the only source of data for before we knew how to do gene sequencing. Yeah, well, it's, yeah, but it's still like the best way. So the gene sequencing is trying to identify the low side. This is answering the question of heritability, right? right? So, um, so it's kind of two different. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I didn't, had no idea it was still useful. Yeah, yeah. Wow. Yeah, it's, it's really interesting stuff. Personality, third from the bottom is surprising yeah. to me. <laughs> so, well, intelligence, too. Intelligence is like equal, almost like equal. Yeah, so this is a pretty interesting, uh, interesting area of study. Uh, um, yeah, so I want to hey, now shift, Chris, guys. Sorry to turn you. Can you go back to the previous slide? slide uh, yeah, I was just noticing, uh, well, I don't know if that's true or not, but um, violent behavior, personality, those are the two that strike me as kind of vague in somewhat vague as opposed to like eye color, blood group. Blood group is very specific, right? There's only a few classifications mm -hmm. and, and it's, it's definitive which one you're in, but like personality is not so definitive. But I don't know, I, I wanted to take another look because I was beginning to suspect that maybe the ones on the bottom are a little more flexible, but maybe they're not all that flexible. Like, di like diabetes and alcoholism would be a little more yeah, yeah. black and white, I guess. Second? They're more environmentally yeah. influenced, yeah. that's all. Hey, Chris, do you have a the citation for this that you could share in the chat? You know what, I'm going to put this, uh, It's it got cut off in the, the uh, let me see here, when I trimmed it, I think I, just so I could fit more on the page. Um, oh no, not on this one. So um, I'll, I'll send this out and then I can just uh, send, post the citation, so. Let me, uh, that would be great. Yeah. Yeah, if you just Google like heritability scores and come up pretty easily, um, post citation. Yeah, I'm pretty bad about, yeah, <laughs> when I pull images and stuff from online and stuff, just pulling them some uh, post citation for heritability. Okay, cool. So yeah, so I mean, this is, uh, it's a really interesting thing, right? We're always, we're all always thinking about these kind of things of like, oh, is this something I should focus my effort on? Like, can I really change my weight or do I have to just accept it? Like, am I skinny or fat or whatever, right? Like these things and, and this, unfortunately, a lot of them are just in the middle, right? <laughs> so it's kind of like, well, I have some control over it, but I don't have total control over it. So what part do I have control over? It's a very interesting, interesting uh, questions. So um, let me see. Oh, and then one, one comment just for my own uh, kind of research and stuff, I do know that schizophrenia is generally much more heritable than autism. So it seems like uh, I know a lot of people come into contact with people with autism and stuff that um, it seems like there's more of an opportunity for environmental intervention in that case than there is in a case like schizophrenia. So, okay. So let's talk about 23andMe briefly. Um, 
So what kind of data does 23andMe collect? So as I was talking about this genotype data, that's basically when you spit in the tube and send it in to them, they're running a very similar kind of experiment on you. What arrays they're using, um, I don't really know. Um, I don't know if that's even public information, but I think it has changed. And so someone like me who did it 10 years ago, they may measure different positions about me, whereas they might measure uh, different positions with someone newer or using a different array. And they may even be able to keep a small part of the sample behind that they store if they need to, to re-examine things, I'm not sure. Um, the haplotype, so how much your SNPs match with certain ethnic groups in the world. This is something that, you know, I think Ryan was the one talking about this at the beginning where um, they, this is something of interest to people, right? But it's of interest for like a day or two and then you're kind of like bored with it, but um, it is interesting to know. Um, uh, the cilantro tastes like soap, so I want to go into some examples of traits that they look at, and then also viewing your raw data, and then the ethics of 23andMe. So I think we've already kind of had a conversation a little bit on that, but we can talk about it some more. Um, so 135, I doubt I'm going to get to the second part, but let me just pull up 23andMe real quick. Um, I want to show you guys this. So for those who do get it or have it or just kind of curious how 23andMe works. You kind of understand it a little, little better. Um, let me see here. So if I go into the traits section for the cilantro thing, um, here, cilantro taste aversion, they have a variety of different traits and stuff that they've measured. Um, go here. And so they have their kind of nice like little wrapper on it that they explain explain what it means, but to get to the more scientific, um, area. So they show you the SNP IDs. So these are the IDs that we were, we were looking at earlier and you can easily look them up in a database and see kind of where they're at in the genome. Um, it tells me my genotype at this position um, and it tells me that this has been correlated with having slightly higher odds of disliking cilantro, um, whereas this one um, is not increased. And so we can look down here a little more and it gives you a little more of the math. Um, and so here's some of the study they did. So one of the, one of the things that 23andMe does is they're constantly asking you questionnaires because they're trying to gather as much phenotypic data as they can on you so they can make these associations. Um, so it is in, in many respects helping research. I know they were doing some COVID stuff as well, um, but I don't know, you know, I don't really know exactly what they're doing with the data. So. Um, so this finding was based on responses from 75,000 people, um, European descent. Um, these are the two markers again, and so they tell you the statistics here. So an A variant associated with slightly higher odds of disliking cilantro, the odds ratio, which is just a measure of the effect size, so a, a, a number close to one is going to be a, like a neutral effect. Um, so it's just a slight positive effect. And then this is the p-value, that they got in the study that they did. Um, and then here's the, here's the other SNP that they, that they found that was associated with. And in addition, they have the papers here that these were reported in. Um, it looks like 23andMe did one of the studies and then this Erickson group did another, another one of the studies. And so this is kind of how it worked initially. I know they're doing a lot of internal research right now, um, but the challenge would be is that a lot of people don't understand how this works. They don't understand that what a false positive is, and they were reporting information like risk of Alzheimer's, um, uh, whether you should take certain drugs or not. They were reporting a lot of this information when the finding could largely just be based on one paper. And so there was a lot of ethical concerns as to whether, you know, if people don't understand how science works and how data analysis works, they're gonna start making decisions because you tell them they have, you know, in this case it's cilantro, but um, of course it doesn't really matter, but um, you know, you're, you're giving them sort of medical advice in a sense, even though you're saying it's not medical advice. So it's an interesting psychology problem um, in terms of how people make decisions around this because it's influenced my thinking and I even understand this stuff. So maybe I'm gullible, but um, it's an interesting, interesting hey, Chris, question. Did, did they do mm -hmm. any correlation uh, between, I mean, 
you were talking about the different or the that chart that you showed previously about nature versus nurture. Is there uh -huh. any indication in here about whether it's more genetic or not, or is that just kind of implied? And I think there's a 13% in there, so they're just saying it's only 13% genetic. Yeah, so that's not, uh, they don't have the heritability stuff. That all comes from twin studies. Um, they're focused more on just the gene association studies. So um, yeah, it could be very minorly heritable, right? So this could have a very small effect, which just from looking at the odds ratio, that's kind of a small odds ratio in the grand scheme of things. So okay. but, but related question about that, like for example, uh, your, your di diabetic uh, kind of gene, and if, for, for example, if you tested 23andMe at age 20, your probability is, let's say, 40%. Does that mean that actually in five years or 10 years, so actually you could get a higher probability on their test? Mm -hmm. Because the, the, you know, diabetic, I can, on, on your chart, it's actually more influenced by environment, right? So how, how much faith you put into their testing results and in consideration of, I mean, really the age you are at. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, for example, the one that the one that I have that it's a pretty well studied gene, APO, uh, APOE. Um, it's implicated in Alzheimer's, and I don't know if I can even see it still. But basically, I have one copy of it. It's very strong scientific finding, but it, I mean, maybe just using context, I was like, well, Alzheimer's not supposed to happen until later on. So my odds now of developing Alzheimer's is is different. And so I don't. I don't think they have some sort of changing thing based on your current information. I think it's just more of a, at least originally when I was digging into this stuff, it was more, you know, oh, people that had Alzheimer's were more likely to have this mutation. And so when you get older, then there's a, a greater chance of you getting Alzheimer's. Right. I think that maybe this kind of is more related to their business model too. Like, um, mm -hmm. Is this supposed to be like a one-time thing that you, you do a test and you, of course, you determine mm. uh, your tendency and, and you don't need to necessarily do it a few more times uh, as you get older, right? Versus right. Uh, from a business point of view, they could encourage you to take more of this test uh, as a way to regulate. Yeah, so your genotype is not changing as you get older. So, um, I mean, there have been incredibly rare and fascinating stories about that actually happening. Um, but like for the most part, your genotype is not changing as you get older. So they would have to introduce, like if they wanted to go the epigenome path, which is the fancy, sexy like area to go into now, um, then they could do something like that because that is changing throughout your life. But your genotype, it should be fixed. There would be a very, very, very incredibly small uh, probability that it's changing. So, so yeah, re, re, unless there's new information that they want to measure right so they're the experiment that they did they didn't look at all the positions that they need to look at then they could try to sell you a new kit um but yeah i don't think that would be a lucrative direction for their for their business so they have to they if they wanted more of a subscription kind of uh you know get do this thing every year to to get some sort of aging thing they would have to measure something else so the genome is not the thing to measure for that right right Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So um, let me see. And just, uh, I'll just kind of focus on this. Uh, your raw data, there's a place to browse your raw data. And so I can literally go in and I can, you know, if there was some study I was reading and it was like, oh, some SNP is associated with, you know, whatever disease, I can go in and look at my genome and just put in that SNP ID. It shows you where it's at, chromosome 11, it's down here. Um, and it shows you, oh, this falls within the gene, DRG2. Um, this is the SNP ID for it. This is the position. These are the possible values that they've seen. And then my genotype, I have one copy of the A and one copy of the G. Um, so is there anything else? I think, yeah, with the haplogroup, was there, I mean, if no one has access to 23andMe, maybe I can like save it as a PDF. But I thought that this report, where's it at? Ancestry composition. Um, there was a report. So they, like Ryan said, right? They give you all your, your different ethnic groups that you've been associated with. So they've taken DNA sequencing from 
people that are, I guess, I, I don't know exactly the, the correct terminology, but basically from a specific area and haven't moved from that area, um, they take their genotypes as well, and then they compare, you know, our genotypes to, to these reference genomes. Um, and then there's really interesting section in here with the, the ancestry composition guide. Um, I can post this on, on there. I think I put the link actually in the talk um, that goes into just the math of how you, how you even do these kind of things. Um, or some of the, so people usually having multi, multiple ancestries, especially in the US where um, there's just, a, we don't know which, uh, which parent the DNA comes from. Um, so there's a lot of these little factors and stuff and how they kind of try to figure this out. Um, different race factors. I thought there was an interesting plot on here, but um, no. Oh, these are like the, the precision and recall based on, based on the way that they assign your heredity. Um, these are the precision and recall rates for different ethnic groups and stuff. And so you can see that the, the recall is not not so great for some of these West African groups, whereas it might be better for other groups and stuff. So, um, yeah, it's just a, it's interesting. They're, they're kind of open in some sense. Um, you know, you can kind of dig around and stuff. They, they try maybe to get that fine line, but um, I don't know how well they've done on that. So let me see here. So the question would be, I have another, um, yeah, probably 45 minutes that I could go. Do people want to have a conversation about what I've talked about? Do you want me to finish it? Do you want to call it? Where, where are we at? I can't see anyone's face. I think I'm interested in at least a sense of the genomics half, maybe a okay. summary. Okay, okay, yeah. I can uh, give you a little bit of that then, so. Um, okay. So whereas the genetics part was much more about an association with what, uh, what base you have at a particular position with the phenotype, the genomics part is much more about how genes are turned on and turned off. So DNA isn't this static molecule that's kind of stacked away like a recipe book is in your house. It's like not shoved away in a drawer. It's actually being interacted with and manipulated all the time so that it can be read from in different areas. And so, um, yeah, genomics is more about how are genes turned on and off in each cell to produce such cellular diversity, even though all the cells have the same genome. So, you know, if, you, if, you, if people have thought carefully about this, they realize we have all of these broad, dip, broadly different cell types in our body, but they all have the exact same genome. How, how exactly is that happening? Um, and so, I think <laughs> I kind of like this analogy. It uh, helps me to sort of, well, hopefully it helps you to understand it a little better. So the, the recipe of, uh, or the, the analogy of DNA as a recipe book, right? So DNA is this long sequence information. It has the recipe for how to make every gene. Um, and so in this case, um, you know, a recipe could make cookies or in this case, a gene or DNA can make a brain. And so, how would we have to change what we think of as a recipe book to actually get it to, to mimic what DNA is more like? So the first thing is I would put a single word on each page. So instead of having a nice page that has a full recipe on it, you're gonna put a single word on each page. Um, then you're going to randomly shuffle all of the pages and then you'll break them into volumes. Um, and then, so genomics is really the study of the mechanisms for switching to the right page at the right time to make the chocolate chip cookies, or in this case, a human brain. And so it's this wildly fascinating thing of GNA, different regions of DNA are being turned on and turned off in these highly coordinated fashions differently in every cell in your body um, all the time. It, it happens over a daily cycle with your circadian rhythm. It happens over developmental trajectories. You know, it happens over a couple of weeks with moods and, you know, just all kinds of things. So this genomics is really the study of this coordinated effort to turn on and off genes. Um, and so each cell is baking something different. So they're, even though they have the same genome, they're doing something very differently with it. Um, 
And I, I like the analogy of evolution as a Rube Goldberg machine, because if you sat down and designed a system that was doing this, you would design it very differently um, than if you let it evolve. Evolution is not this nice framework that can theoretically think about something and uh, design a nice solution to it. It very haphazardly stumbles upon things that work and those things that work um, get to reproduce and those things that don't work don't reproduce. And so it ends up with this crazy structure um, as to how genes are turned on and off. So just a easy, easy to understand example of one way to turn genes on and off has to do with manipulating the accessibility of DNA. So as Hobbes was asking earlier, is the structure of the, of the two different strands of DNA, not the strands, but the two different alleles of DNA, is it the same? And so in reality, we have those nice little pictures of the chromosomes all tightly coiled up and making those little, those little X shapes or attached to the hip there. But in reality, it's, it's much messier than that. Um, if you zoom in, you're gonna see that there are some little regions of DNA that are kind of relatively open and exposed, and there are some that are really tightly packed, and you can't really get in there. And so this figure up here on the right, this little pink area, the, the, purple, the purple line is DNA. And so this little pink area is gonna be a gene. And so the way that it's coiled up, it's relatively accessible. And so this gene maybe could be turned on pretty easily. Whereas this gene over here on the left is tightly coiled up, you can't really access it. And so nothing can get in there to make a copy of it and express it. And so this is just kind of one mechanism that the body that evolution has created for turning genes on and off. There are tons of these mechanisms um, for turning genes on and off or turning them up and down. Um, there's DNA methylation, which is what I studied. There's chromatin accessibility. There's histone modifications. There's chromosome interactions. There's all kinds of these. And um, the key point is that the genome is a spatially and temporally dynamic structure and thus, uh, so is gene expression. So, um, what, yeah, I think there's a lot of opportunities. So a lot of the, the GWAS stuff, for example, the, the people don't tend to use machine learning in that as much because it's a more straightforward problem. Whereas trying to prove whether a protein is being Being expressed or not, there's so, so much to, um, to try to apply machine learning to. So, take someone's DNA sequence, Geo. Um, whenever we do a genomic study, we have to basically upload all of that data. Um, so it's all publicly available. If anyone has interest, you're more than welcome to email me. I can kind of point you in the right direction. 
um, on how to handle handle this kind of data and stuff um, and, and do analyses. Um, let me see what would make sense to show of the rest. There's still a little bit, eh, let's just power through. Still got a little bit. Um, okay, so now that's kind of the, the background of the biology. I'll tell you guys a little bit about the, one of the experiments that I did, uh, that I worked on when I was in grad school. So when I got there, um, the brain initiative problem um, ha had been started. And one of the key goals of this was to identify cell types in the brain because we didn't have a, a good atlas for this yet. And so um, our hypothesis was that we can use DNA methylation, which is one of these uh, modifications to DNA that can turn genes on and off. Um, we can use that in individual cells and cluster them to identify cell types. And I underlined individual cells there because this is the really the key revolution that's happening right now in molecular biology and genomics, which is that previously when we were doing an experiment, we would just take a lump of tissue and process that and look at the gene expression or some sort of uh, readout on those. But tissue is very diverse. There's different cell types in it. Your signal is going to be dominated by the majority cell type, but what if the minority cell type is actually, you know, the cell that's messed up or is, is the thing that you're interested in? And so uh, through some pretty cool innovation, they've been able to separate out individual cells now. And so we were able to do single cell um, methylation. And so um, we published it in Science a couple of years ago and stuff, if you want to read the details. Um, and so let me explain the DNA methylation thing real quick. This, bear with me. I don't think it's that complicated, but I know I've thrown a lot at you already. Um, okay, so what DNA methylation is, is basically the cytosines, so the C's in DNA, can have a methyl group bind to them or not. And so you can see here, there are two cytosines that have this methyl group shown on them, um, and these, this one doesn't have it, okay? And so the interpretation of what this methyl group is doing is that if the gene, if this blue thing is a sequence of DNA, and this is where your recipe for the gene is at, um, the sequence for the gene, then to, to start making copies of that and express that gene, you have some sort of proteins that come in here and bind to DNA, and then they can start making copies of this. Well, with the methylation, if that methylation is there, it actually creates a, like a, a repulsion, or it blocks those, these uh, molecules from coming in and binding to it, and thus it shuts off the gene. And so our hypothesis was that, well, if we look at, uh, because this plays a role in gene regulation, if we look at this methylation across the whole genome, then we should be able to cluster the cells and get the, the cell types. And so just a quick, uh, quick little aside as to the importance of DNA methylation. So um, the, I guess the example of the power of DNA methylation is in bees. So a worker bee and a bee that will become a queen has exactly the same DNA. What happens is that the worker bee eats what's called royal jelly. And that sets off a bunch of changes in DNA methylation which leads to it having a very different phenotype. So it becomes bigger, reproduction, there's all these things that are activated from this royal jelly that goes in and modifies the, the DNA methylation. So it's known to have a really strong importance. Um, let me see, so there's a clever way as to how we measure it. Um, basically, if this is our sequence, which I showed you on the previous page, um, and we wanna measure which cytosines are methylated, what we first do is we treat it, uh, you treat the DNA with bisulfite, and what's gonna happen is any cytosine that is unmethylated is gonna be converted to a U, it's a uracil. Uh, and so then we can take this and sequence it. The key point here, there's a small change, which is that the U's are sequenced as T's. So the sequencing machines can't distinguish a U from a T, so it just shows up as a T. And so now we can compare what we actually sequence with our reference genome. And we can see where the C's um, in the reference genome are. And we sequence the T, we know that that was methylated. And where the C's are in the genome reference, but we, um, here, let me use the cursor, uh, but we actually sequenced a T, we know that those were unmethylated. 
Okay. So um, using this, we can construct the whole methylome. Um, you know, the, the methylome is the methylation across the whole genome. And so we can reconstruct this. And then we, um, we basically go on to do the analysis, which I have a few pages on that to show you. Um, just a quick note here in this, with the sequencing, we're actually using DNA sequencing. I know I wouldn't have time to go into the details of this, but it's different from genotyping. I have a link here to the uh, Illumina, uh, Illumina YouTube video that does a really good explanation of it. So if you guys want to understand kind of the difference as to how this uh, uh, sequencing by synthesis or next generation sequencing works, um, I would point you to that video there. Um, okay, so now that we've collected a bunch of cells, there's a couple thousand, um, and we have their methylation profile, I can just do a data dimensionality reduction, right? This is very high dimensional data. So the first step was do a dimensionality reduction on it. And this didn't look very interesting because PCA is usually not the best way. Um, fortunately, TSNI had been developed at that point. And so we used it to do dimensionality reduction on it. And so the plus is that it looks like we have some clear clusters here, um, but then we have some that are maybe a little less clear. And so the next question is, well, maybe we need to somehow identify what these clusters are, right? We need some sort of unbiased clustering algorithm that will, will identify them. Um, and so after we did that, I didn't include those details in here. It's, a, it's an algorithm called Backspin. It's very kind of off the beaten path. I don't think it's gained much traction, so I don't, I'm not gonna waste your time explaining it, but basically it's a divisive clustering algorithm where you sort the cells in order based on similarity and you find an optimal cut point, and then you split it into two groups. And then you recursively apply that on the, on the subgroups until you get to a stopping point. So it's just like a type of divisive uh, dividing algorithm. Um, after we clustered them and, and sorted the correlation matrix, um, you can see that there's very nice structure here in the data. So I'm just showing you the correlation of the DNA methylation um, uh, correlated with itself, basically. So you can see there seems to be some clusters here, um, maybe a cluster here, and then some additional, st additional structure here. And so as I mentioned, the backspin algorithm. So this is the clustering that we come up with. Um, and the, the next real question is just to identify um, what these clusters are, okay? So we, we got clusters, we were able to computationally select them out, and now it's like, well, do they mean anything? And so one of the ways that we did this, fortunately the group had the foresight, is that the cells, so they all come from the cortex of the cell, or of, the, of a mouse. And what Marga did here when she was doing the dissection is she basically split it so that this top section of the cortex was one, tit, one sample, and then the middle cortex was another sample, and the bottom cortex was another sample. And so I had labels as to which cell came from which of those samples, and so I can um, take a random smattering and see you get that uh, pattern. I can do the superficial layer, which is the, the top layer up here. And I get a very clear set of clusters that seem to be in the superficial layer. Um, the middle layer seems to be kind of here in the center and then some what distributed throughout the bottom. And then the deep layer ones were distributed throughout through the bottom. And so this gave us a pretty good indication as the layer of the, of the cortex was playing an important role in the classification. And so using that information, we were able to identify different cell types. Um, the layer is, is something that's very well known in neuroscience. There's clear circuits that kind of run across the layer and you know, one kind of neuron is in the top, one is in the bottom, et cetera. So this was kind of using a lot of the information that, we, that, that other researchers had already gained, we used that to inform whether our clusters made sense. Um, the other thing, we did, a, we did a whole bunch of different things, but I'm trying to take the easiest ones to understand. The other thing is that we had what I would call purified samples of different cell types. And so I plugged those in with the single cells that I had and did a clustering. And you can see that there's a very clear matching up. Um, these here, these PB ones are a purified cell type called Parvel Buman. Um, these SST ones are a cell type, these here are a cell type, um, and these here as well. These are kind of combinations of cell types, so 
I won't go too much into that, but um, we used a bunch of methods like this to, to kind of identify what the clusters were. And then uh, we end up with 16 different neuron types that we found in mouse um, going from left to right. So this purple area was all the excitatory cell types that we found and the right was the inhibitory cell types that we found. And this is a very, you know, kind of logical breakdown. This is something neuroscientists already know about the brain. Um, and then on the y-axis, it's the layers. So it starts with the deep layers down here and goes into the upper, the upper more superficial layers. And what's really cool is that these inhibitory cells over here, they're jammed in a smaller area, but this differentiation we're actually able to statistically show is consistent with the layering. Um, and so that was, that was pretty cool. So um, TSNE, although not really knowing anything about these attributes from a, from a top-down sense, was able to you know, basically extract out layer and then inhibitory excitatory. And then with human, we did the same thing. Um, we got 21 cell types, so, so there's some difference between human and mouse. Um, it's a little difficult to do a comparison between them, um, but yeah, so a similar thing with human, and then that's the people I worked with on it. Um, so yeah, I think that's largely it. Um, the, so genomics is, and I wanted to, one of the reasons why I wanted to give this talk is just because I think genomics is an exciting area with a lot of open questions. There's a lot of public data. Um, San Diego and the Bay Area are huge in biotech, so if people are looking to get involved in things, I'm sure you can get involved at a research lab at UCSD. They're always looking for people willing to work for cheap to learn things. Um, so there's a lot of opportunity in this area. It's really interesting. Um, the thing that drives my passion and interest in this area is that evolution and development are computational processes that produce intelligence. So, you know, one of the reasons why I was in a cognitive science department for my PhD was that, you know, understanding how the brain works and taking a reductionist approach, like what is that process for actually building a brain? Um, and, and honestly, how did evolution in, in, end up in this direction, right? Was it a chance? Was it, a, is it, is it sort of always going to produce something of intelligence over time? All these, these questions are kind of the fascinating ones to me. Um, yeah, hopefully you understand your 23 and be better if you have it. And then, um, yeah, so thanks. And you can contact me if you have any questions. And if there's anything that I need to post, I've got the citation for the heredity stuff. If there's anything else you guys need, just let me know. Or you can ping me on Slack too. So I think that's it. Any questions? The genomic stuff is much more complicated, so I imagine that it's it's more confusing as well. So, but yeah, the key the key opportunity there is if you're interested in a protein or something, then the understanding all the mechanisms that control that protein and how um, they can go awry. Um, it's, a, it's a really good machine learning problem and it's, a, it's an interesting problem too. Here's my... So this isn't purely talk related, but in that new, the, the well-be health, yeah, yeah. That, is that in any way related to genomics? Is that something that you're digging into? We don't have genomics data at this point. It's more of a behavioral neuroscience kind of thing. Um, so using people's data and data that we collect from individuals, can we actually, you know, give people optimized care plans? It really comes down to behavioral change, right? Like, I don't think people know what to do. Um, and we're recording, it's, it's also like a, a, what do you call it? Uh, metrics um oh god patient metrics uh things so the doctors can basically access their metrics as they weigh in and stuff and keep an eye on it patient patient monitoring program um but yeah the machine learning stuff i'm really playing like a largely a marketing role and strategy role at this point um and hopefully over time we'll get more data on people once we get kind of a stable product and uh can can start looking at those things i doubt doubt we'll ever get sequencing data or genomics data on them to, to look into that. But definitely 
you know, mining the literature and looking for, for what's known about, about these questions is, is, will be helpful. I've had to do a lot of that so far. <clears throat> All right, well, with that, so if people have any questions, they can contact me. I can post the slides. There are a few links in there and stuff in case people find them useful. So, cool. Awesome, thanks, Chris. All right.